If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask if you would to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12. Now, I don't know this because I haven't taken the personal survey, but I would imagine if I went around our community and um, asked people, what is it that keeps you from going to church? Even though I think this is probably just more of an excuse than a reality, I think most of them would say because there's hypocrites, too many hypocrites in church. You know, I've, I've heard that a lot anyway. Just too many hypocrites in church. I, I, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm going to get all my act together before I go to church, you know, something like that. And today we're going to talk a little bit about hypocrisy because it is such a big deal. In Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, Jesus says, When a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Now, the scene here is that there are so many people there to listen to Jesus or to see Jesus. And Jesus tells his disciples, he's not talking to the crowd, he's talking to those who are closest to him. And he says, be on your guard or beware of, of the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, I'm not a great cook by any stretch of imagination. Miss Kitty may use yeast. I don't know exactly what it is. I just know what it's supposed to do. It's, a, it's supposed to be put in the dough, and it makes the dough rise. It affects the whole batch just a little bit. doesn't take a lot of yeast, from my understanding, to affect the whole bunch. It starts small. It's really not noticeable. And then like a cancer, in a sense, it, it grows and Jesus in this passage is not warning the Pharisees. He's warning his disciples. And, and he's saying that be aware, be on guard, because it's very simple, it's very easy for leaven of the Pharisees or hypocrisy to slip into your life. It can come in hardly unnoticed. Now why would Jesus warn his disciples about hypocrisy? Because it does creep in. It creeps into your spiritual life. And hypocrisy actually can destroy your spirit. At least your spiritual life. Secrets make us sick. Secrets are what causes addicts to keep on using. Secrets are what allow women or cause women to stay in abusive relationships. Secrets... Or what's making many of you sick here today with depression, with hopelessness. Because you see, hypocrisy is not sinning, and I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Hypocrisy is the secret. Hypocrisy is the pretending that you don't. It's the fear that you will be found out. It's sort of like you put on this facade and you don't really want anyone to know the real you as I said hypocrisy is not sinning and yet Jesus had the, whole, the the strongest words in the Bible for hypocrites but as I said hypocrisy is, is not sinning as a matter of fact it's uh it's not even continual sinning and some people talk about, well, I don't want to go to church because I'll feel like a hypocrite because I'm sinning or I'm still living in sin. Well, uh, the church in reality should be a place where you come when you're sinning. We have it backward today. We want to get our lives together and then come to church. But the Bible teaches us that we need to come to church while we're sinning. It's, it's here that we're the hospital. The church should be the hospital for the sick and the dying, for the sinful people of the world. There are strongholds in many of our lives today. There are compulsions. There are hang-ups. And I'm talking to people that are here this morning. There are compulsions and habits and hang-ups. 
And, and maybe we tried to good deed them out. You know, we, we tried to be a better person and only to find out that makes us feel worse. Or maybe we tried to church them out or pray them out or do more good for God, you know, in, in hopes that the demons would leave us alone and give us victory. But yet we find ourselves trapped in this depression and this continual cycle, as Brother John talked about this morning, of shame. You see, hypocrisy, as I said, is not sinning or sinning and still coming to church. Hypocrisy is not even sinning and claiming to be a Christian. Hypocrisy is pretending you don't sin. You see, the very word hypocrite is the word play actor. If you can think about somebody who used to put on these plays back in the olden days and they, they would have different masks and they would hold these masks over their face. That's what a hypocrite is. It's someone who hides behind a, a facade. It's, it's pretending to be something you not, you're not. It's putting on a mask. And yet Jesus has the strongest words for people who pretend that they don't sin. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you feel like that's all you are is a hypocrite. You feel like you're a pretender. You're just play acting. Because you act like you got it all together when in reality all you want to do right now is really break down and cry. You, your life is not all together. You wonder why you can't have it all together. Like the rest of the church folks, right? You look around you and you say, I don't fit in here, man. Everybody else has it all together except for me, man. My marriage is crumbling. Man, I'm struggling with this habitual, continual sin. And, and, and I don't want to go there and feel guilty because everybody else has it all together. Folks, let me tell you what. If you think everybody in this building has it all together, you're sadly mistaken. You see, what you're, what you're seeing here is you're seeing the very thing Jesus is talking about. You're seeing hypocrisy, which is we're pretending that we have it all together when in reality we don't. And so many times what we try to do is we just simply try to try harder and we only dis, uh, disappoint ourselves once again because we can't overcome on our own. We can't figure out what's going on and what's wrong with us. And we may even give, give up. We may even want to quit and say, well, church doesn't work for me or Jesus doesn't work for me because we feel like hypocrites. Today, I'm going to give you the solution. Today, I'm going to give you the cure to hypocrisy. I talked to a young man, I remember several years ago, he was from a different denomination, a very dogmatic, works-driven uh, denomination, and he was talking about he was, going, he was going to be a preacher, he actually was going to school. Well, one day I saw him out, and he was on the streets again, he was drinking and running around, and, and I asked him, I said, man, Ken, I thought you were going to be a preacher, and he said, well, he said, I can't, and I said, why can't you? He said, well, I can't be perfect. And he said, if I can't be perfect, I might as well just give up. And for many of us, that's the way we feel. Well, I, 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 I tried to live for Jesus. I, I'm trying to live righteous. I'm, I'm trying to keep my promises. I'm trying to keep my, but I can't do it. And I keep failing and I keep falling. So I just feel like such a hypocrite. I'm just going to give in to the sin and it's going to take all the pressure off. And you know what? In a sense, it does, doesn't it? I mean, to all of a sudden, just give back in to whatever it is that was driving you and to just say, I can't live. I can't fake it anymore. Well, that's great. I'm glad you've come to a point uh, to, of realizing that you don't have to fake it anymore or that you cannot fake it anymore. You see, that's why we all need Jesus. That's why we need him. That's why we should be coming to church is because we don't have to fake it here. We don't have to put on a face here. Do you remember when you first gave your heart and your life to Christ? Man, you didn't know much about things. You didn't know much about church. You didn't know much about the Bible. All you knew is there was something missing in your heart and something missing in your life. And you also knew that, man, you were tired of being lonely. You were tired of being depressed. You were tired of giving in to this sin. And you just wanted you just wanted some hope. And so what did you do? You you prayed a prayer with Brother Wade and you came up and you were baptized and, and you probably went out and bought you a Bible. You may have even had your name uh, written on it. You see, at first it was all simple, wasn't it? At first it was simply, I just need Jesus. That's it. That's all I want. I, all I want is him. You know, I, I just want to feel some peace in my life. And I just want some, st some stability in the middle of this chaos. But then you started to learn. You started looking around. And, you know, how we learn anything is by imitation. So we looked around and we saw uh, Brother Gene carrying a Bible. So we got us a Bible and we looked around. And we saw these uh, folks uh, not using the language that we were using. So we tried to clean up our language. And then we started trying to dress a little bit the way the, the church folks 
folks dress and, and we started trying to do churchy things. And, and, and what happened was is that we lost our first love. We, we learned how to dress like others. We learned how to read the Bible. We learned how to even pray maybe out loud, really pretty. But we lost our first love. We forsook what got us here because we started pretending to be something that we're really not. You know, it's so amazing when I hear somebody share a testimony and they'll come up and they'll share about their lives and it, they, they talk about, and you've heard them, they talk about what, you, what they used to be like, which is awesome, and, and, and how that Jesus saved them and what their life is like now. And, and it's amazing some of, the, some of the drastic change that occurred. But they, send a, they tend to stop right there, don't they? Oh, I used to be so rotten and stinking and dirty and now I'm so good. Well, you're not, though. You're, you're really not. You know, I, I used to love to go to AA meetings or, or meetings like that where people would share what they're dealing with now because that's what was relevant to me. I want to know what you're dealing with now, you know, because we're not perfect yet. We're not there yet. You haven't arrived just because you got you a tie or just because you come to church. Or just because you, you uh, straightened out some of your language, you know? And then what happens is, is that we begin to hide our sin. We begin to kind of push it back and we put on this image and this facade. And then what happens is a dryness seems to come in our life. And it, everything becomes dry for us. People uh, you trusted maybe fail and let you down. You kept repeating the same old sins and you disappointed the, yourself. Uh, maybe you thought that God had given up on you, you know? But you were trying to protect this image and you forsook your first love. You forsook what got you here, which was simply Jesus. That's it. And we need to get back to that. You know, Jesus, as I said, had strong words for the Pharisees and the hypocrites. And I think he would have these same words for us today. When he says to, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 through 28, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees and hip you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind guides, blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous but inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And I'm not so sure if Jesus was not preaching to the churches of America today, he would be saying the exact same thing. You, you, you're all cleaned up on the outside. You seem like you've got it all together. You, you, you've washed the outside of the cup. You're, you're like a whitewashed tomb. It's so beautiful, this monument glistening in the sun. But inside, you're full of dead men bones. You're dead inside. There's no life inside you. You're not clean inside. You see, hypocrisy begins small, as I said. But because we neglect the real love, the real reason that we're here, which is Jesus. I venture to say most things that go into church in churches today have very little to do with Jesus anymore. Most of the things we do are planned, they're choreographed, they're budgeted, they're organized without too much thought about what Jesus will do or what Jesus would do because we've got it all together now. We've grown. We've got the money in our bank account, you know, and things are looking good. And the same thing occurs in our own lives. Many of us this morning may be asking when Brother Wade asked the question, how can I serve the church? We may be saying, well, I, I really can't serve the church because I'm still living in sin. Well, the reason you're living in sin, everybody has sin in their life. The issue is the hypocrisy lies in the cover up of that sin. And if you do not have a place where you can come and feel safe to let down your hair and take off your mask, then you're going to continue to live in that sin. You're never going to get victory as long as you hide it. 
addictions and, and, and compulsions and depression grow in the dark. They, they grow in secret. And that's exactly what hypocrisy is. Remember, Jesus was not talking to the Pharisees at the beginning of the passage that we read about hypocrisy. He was talking to his own disciples, his own church, and he said, beware because hypocrisy can creep into your life. And you'll pretend to be something that you're really not. You see, eventually, it can consume every part of you. I wonder today if I could ask you how many of you would, 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 would confess your sin in front of a whole group. Well, that would be awfully hard, wouldn't it? But yet there's got to be a group of people that you have that you can be honest with, that you can talk to about. In the book of James chapter 5, it says this, and I'm going to read James chapter 5. There's a passage here, and I'll get over here to it. In James chapter 5, I want you to listen to this passage. It says, is there anyone, in James chapter 5, verse 13, is there anyone among you who is in trouble, let him pray. Is anyone happy, let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick, let him call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of Jesus. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned and they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, what's James saying here? He's saying that, first of all, if you're sick, and I don't think he's just talking about physically sick, even though that is probably included in this. He's talking about emotionally sick. He's talking about spiritually sick. If there's anyone among you that is sick, first of all, call upon the elders to pray over you. And what is elders? Elders means the pastors, the leaders of the church, right? Call upon the elders to pray over you, anoint you with oil. But then it goes on to say in the same passage here, if any of you uh, among you are sick, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Now listen to me, folks. I don't want you to catch this because Satan doesn't want you to know this. You see, you in your mind think that in order for me to be close to God, I got to live this holy, righteous life, right? That God gets disappointed in me when I'm not holy and I'm not righteous and I'm not living in a certain way. Now, first of all, the word holiness actually means set apart for God's use. That's what it means. So if you're holy today, you're set apart for God's use. That means God wants to use you just as you are, just where you are. God wants to use your mouth. He wants to use your hands. He wants to use uh, your feet. He wants to use you to share the gospel. He wants to use you to serve this world and to help bring about the kingdom of God. So holiness is not something necessarily that this this life of a of a of some holy man sitting on the side of a mountaintop who's very close to God. Holiness simply means you're set apart for the use of God. Now righteousness is another word that the Bible teaches us that there is no one righteous, no not one. Now, but but James just said the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So if there's no one righteous, no, not one, then how, does, how can I get righteous and make my prayers effective to God? The way you are made righteous is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. There's nothing else. Nothing else you can do will make you right with God. I want you to listen to me. What happens is this. When Jesus went to the cross and died in your place, he took upon himself all of your sin, everything that you've ever done. And because he was a perfect, spotless lamb of God, he took upon himself your sin and he gave to you his righteousness. Righteousness comes through Christ alone. Nothing else. Nothing else. So basically, when James is talking about righteousness here, he's talking about a person that has the righteousness of Christ in them. And Christ is not going to flow through your life 
If you're covering all your sin up, because every time I cover my sin up, I'm not giving the glory to God. I have people tell me all the time. I did, especially when I share my testimony. They say, why do you still want to talk about your past? Why do you still want to talk about all the horrible things that you did? Let it go. Forgive yourself. Hey, man, I don't know about forgiving myself, but I do know this, that every single time I share my dirt, and I do that about every Thursday night in, in Life Recovery. I've told you many times, if you want to hear it, come Thursday nights, 630. But I share my dirt, and every time I share my struggles, my dirt, then what happens is Christ is glorified. Because what I have and the only hope I have for heaven is through what Christ has done for me. And, and I don't want people to put their eyes on me. If you put your eyes on me, if you follow me, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fail, and you're going to trip over top of me. And I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen in other churches where I pastored. And when I fell, they fell along with me because their eyes were on the man. Your eyes cannot be fixed on the man. Your eyes have to be fixed on Christ and Christ alone. Now, folks, let me tell you this. I've done the sermon that I preached this morning. Man, I've done it all. Man, if I sit here and told you all of my stuff that I've done in my life, all the sins I've committed, I would even shock some of you. I promise you I would. But the thing about it is, is that the whole time that I was doing those sins, I was going to church. I was working in church. I was pastoring even. That in itself was not the hypocrisy. That's what I want you to get. Me sinning and working in church was not the hypocrisy. The hypocrisy was pretending and playing like I wasn't struggling. If I had known this simple secret that is so true, if I'd have only just read the Bible and had it been enlightened to me years ago, how much more victory could I have lived in had I just recognized, Wade, be honest and quit lying and reached out for help. Some of you in here will never reach out for help. You know why you'll never reach out for help? Because you'll never want me to know what you're dealing with. You don't. You don't want anybody to know. And so you hide it. And as you hide it and as you bury it, uh, this, this darkness grows inside you. Because Jesus says, the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And yet most of us are living a lie. Most of us are living a lie. And we wonder why we don't have victory. God is not going to do anything for you as long as you're pretending like you got it all together. As long as you're faking it. Some point, at some point, you've got to come out of your hypocrisy and give it to Christ. Now, how, how do I overcome hypocrisy? Well, first of all, the first step is to realize that you are one. You, 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 can't, you can't quit uh, drinking till you say I'm an alcoholic. You can't quit using drugs till you say I'm an addict. You can't quit living in, in depression until you say I'm depressed. You can't keep living. You, you can't overcome sin until you admit that you sin. You can't. It's impossible. God's not going to work where you're lying. He's not. So you've got to be able to come to the point of realizing I am a hypocrite. And you know who's the hardest people to convince they're hypocrites is church folks. Because you've, you've lived this facade so long, you've, you've projected that image. Oh, what if I tell people I'm a deacon of the church? Sorry, deacons. I'm a deacon of the church and, 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 and I'm drinking. What if I tell people? What are they going to say? Who cares what they think? Shouldn't it matter what God knows? What does it matter what they think about you? Man, do you not see you're rotting? You're destroying your own life? You're like a dead man with a white, in a whitewashed tomb pretending you got it all together? Who cares? You know what I found out? Very few, probably nobody, really. I mean, people, you know, I, I'm so worried, man, that somebody will find out that I'm smoking. I'm so worried that somebody will find out that my marriage is crumbling. 
I'm so worried that somebody's going to find out that uh, that I'm, my marriage is crumbling or, or that I'm depressed. I'm so worried that somebody's going to find out that I drink. I'm so worried that somebody's going to find out that I uh, abuse prescription medicine. I'm so worried that somebody's going to find out. You know what? If they found out, they wouldn't care. They don't care. Oh, they may talk about you a little bit, but they don't really care. They ain't going to move on with their life till the next person comes up they can gossip about. And here you are, all in bondage, worried about what somebody else thinks. Destroying your life. Living in, living in defeat. Because you're too afraid of what someone else thinks. The first key to getting help is to realize you need help. Second key is this. To confess your sin and your shortcomings and brokenness to God. Let God know he already does. Just, just say it. Why do you want to say this? Uh, Father, forgive me of my sins. That's beautiful. I, I hear that prayer all the time. Everybody seems to pray publicly. Always says that. Uh, Father, uh, forgive us for our sins. What sins? What you talking about? I mean, you know, you come up to me and say, Wade, forgive me. Okay. Well, for what? Shouldn't we name it? <laughs> I mean, shouldn't you ask him what, shouldn't you tell him what you want forgiveness for? Shouldn't you confess it? Or do we just want to blanket it and look holy and righteous? Father, forgive us for our many sins. Well, I'd like to hear what your many sins are, God may be saying. Because, see, I want you to confess it to me. I want to know exactly what you're talking about. And it's not that God doesn't know, but God wants you to know that he knows. Because we're trying to hide it. We pretend like we got it all together. Man, you ain't got it all together. And so what happens is, is that we, we need to come to a point of realizing and confessing our sins and shortcoming and brokenness to God. And the third one is get off your pedestal and confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, Elijah was an awesome prophet of God. Elijah outran some horses one time. Elijah actually one time on Mount Carmel challenged the uh, prophets of Baal and actually prayed to God and called down fire from heaven and God consumed the sacrifices. Man, what an awesome man of God. Right? Elijah, God did mighty things and, 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 and James talks about here one, one time that Elijah prayed that it would not rain and for seven years it didn't rain. And all of a sudden Elijah stepped out after the people repented and he called, that, called for God to bring down rain and it began to rain. Man, wouldn't you like to have that kind of power flowing through your life? That's exactly what James is talking about. This prayer of a righteous man. What made him righteous? Well, James had just told you he confessed his faults to one another. And he prayed to one another. If you read the story of Elijah, what you find is Elijah was also a man that was depressed. Elijah was also a man that lived in deep depression. The doctors would have said, you need some Paxil. You really do. You need some Zoloft or something. Man, you are so dark, Elijah. Elijah did. He, he lived in depression. Matter of fact, one time Elijah was like so self-pitying. He said, oh, God. I'm the only prophet. I'm the only believer left in all of Israel. Now, it's just me. Just me and you, God. Everybody's forsaken you. And God said, are you crazy? Man, I got thousands and thousands of people who have not bent their knee to Baal. You're not the only one. You see, but he was so self-centered and so self-pitying and so selfish and, and wrapped up in his own depression. And you know how I know that? Listen to Do you know how I know Elijah did this? You know how I know Elijah was selfish? And you know how I know Elijah was depressed? You say, yeah, I know how you know, because it's in the Bible. Well, who do you think told that it could be written in the Bible? Because it was just Elijah and God alone. So who did he, he had to tell somebody. He had to tell somebody, hey, guess what I did? <laughs> Man, I, I told God one day I was the only prophet left. He had to tell somebody for somebody to write it down. Have you ever thought about that? He had to tell somebody, man. I was standing on a mountainside one day and in the cave, and, and, and I wasn't even going to ever come out again. I was just going to bury myself and hide myself in a cave. And then God appeared to me in a still, small voice and spoke to my heart. Who do you think told that? It was just God and him. He told it. He confessed. He said, man, I'm selfish. I'm depressed. When you read the New Testament, you know what, to me, rings true and makes to me the New Testament seem more fact than fiction 
It's because the disciples who wrote it always wrote so badly about themselves. I mean, Peter, Peter denying Christ. That, who, who told that? I mean, there were no other disciples around Peter when he denied Christ. It was just a bunch of folks around a fire somewhere, warming themselves. Peter told, Peter said, I denied Christ. Who do you think told, uh, uh, that said, when Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. And, and, and Peter was actually called Satan. Who do you think told that? Peter told it. Peter said, one day, man, I was saying this, and Jesus looked at me and said, get thee behind me, Satan. To his disciple, Peter. Now that's, he, they confess their shortcomings. They, they weren't perfect men. And listen to me, people. You're not perfect. You're not. You're never going to be. You're going to struggle. You see, the key and the issue and what it really means to be a Christian is, is, is not that you don't fall down. It's that you get up. That you keep on trying. That you don't quit. And sometimes, guess what? You're going to struggle with certain sins. Listen to me. I'm about to close. You're going to struggle with certain sins all your life. You are. And I think that's why Paul says, you know, what I want to do, I don't do. What I try not to do, I do. And I think that's why also Paul says one time, he says that three times I asked God to take this messenger of Satan away from me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your, in your weakness. So what he's saying is this, that sometimes God will allow sin to continue in our lives without giving us instantaneous victory because God wants to keep you on your knees. God wants to keep you humble. You're not perfect. You want victory this morning? Then just be honest, man. Just be honest. You know why there's more of you not coming to our life recovery program on 6:30 at 6:30 on Thursday nights? Because you're a hypocrite. That's the honest to God truth. You are. You don't want anybody to know you got no issues. I don't want nobody to know I got any problems. Man, I'm not gonna go there. People will be talking about me. Once again, who cares? Who cares? Nobody. You, you may be the headline news for about five minutes, and then you off everybody's radar. They done moved on to somebody else. So don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. You know who you need to worry about? You need to worry about God. You need to worry about your family. You need to worry about yourself. You need to get it together, folks. And the only way we're going to come out of our hypocrisy, the only cure, listen to me, the only cure, Ben Wallace, is honesty. That is the only, only cure. So go ahead, hide in your sin. Go ahead, pretend like you got it all together. We'll eventually find out when you sign up for your divorce. We'll all read the news. We'll eventually find out when you finally get caught smoking dope or drinking too much and get your DUI. We'll find out. We'll find out. It'll all, Jesus already said it. <laughs> what you're doing in secret is going to be shouted from the housetop. It's going to come, it's going to come that day. So go ahead and hide it. But you know what the beautiful thing is about confessing your sin, Richard, is this. If I confess my fault to you, then when I fall, you know I, why I fell, brother. Because I ain't, I ain't got nothing to hide. If I'm telling you I'm struggling with this, and you already know it. You can't hold it against me, can you? I take all the power out of that darkness when I'm honest and when I'm real. It's time for some of us to get real. Matter of fact, some of you today, if you died right now, you probably wouldn't go to heaven because of the fact you've been hiding all your life. You've never been honest. You've never been real. You've never truly given your heart and life to Christ because you've tried to do your little good works and put on your little facade and pretend to be something you're not. And you've never truly, there's some of you in this today, you've heard me preach now for three years and there's been some time, man, you gripped that pew, whoo, I need to go forward, I need to be saved, man, but I can't go forward, I can't go, I can't go up there because, man, when I was 10 years old, I was baptized. True. I can't go front, man. What will everybody say? Man, the, what would daddy say? Man, I, I was baptized when I was 10 years old. Now, am I going to go up there and tell people I wasn't a Christian? So you will go to hell for that? Because of your pride? Do you not realize that that's where it's all grounded? That that's where uh, hypocrisy is all grounded is in the sin of pride? And so you're going to sit there on your pew and pretend like you've got it all together, pretend like you're a Christian, and you're really even not. And it's sad. And we see it throughout churches all over the Bible Belt today because they were raised in church by mamas and daddies 
and they were gave, made this profession of faith when they were eight or nine or ten or even fifteen that did not change their lives because they never recognized it's not what you do, but it's what God uh, has done for you on the cross. I'm asking if you would to stand with me right now. We're gonna have a